every day. No opinion. Okay. Uh, how many of you have used it quite a bit and feel comfortable using it? Okay. Let's list hands and work the floor. <laughs> All right. So uh, TensorFlow is basically a tool for building computational graphs. I, everyone sort of talks about it as this deep learning uh, tool, and it is that, but it actually can do a lot more than just pure deep learning. You can do you know, uh, lots of different things with TensorFlow. And one of the things tonight I'm going to try and do is, is show you some of the things in relation to that. Uh, the other thing that makes it so special is it allows you, you know, to take this graph and distribute it over many CPUs or GPUs. So it allows you to basically deal with extremely large data sets and train them over you know, 64 GPUs, 128 GPUs. All right. Up to now, I know pure TensorFlow right, has been a very low level library. All right, so we'll talk about later on about some of the announcements that happened today I, and some of the things that are sort of changing. But pure what I'm going to call sort of pure TensorFlow I, is a very low level library. And on top of that, I've built a lot of other libraries that many of you have used, things like Keras, uh, TFLearn, uh, TFSlim. Uh, there's quite a number of them now. I, the other thing is TensorFlow by far is the, you know, is by far becoming the standard uh, deep learning library out there. All right, when you look at like the number of stars, the number of commits on, you, you know, everything on GitHub in relation to this, you look at news articles, you look at tutorials, everything is sort of going towards TensorFlow. And I think especially after 1.0, which was just released overnight, that's going to accelerate even more. So. I talked about pure TensorFlow versus sort of like these high-level abstraction APIs. I, you always have the most amount of control when you're using pure TensorFlow. While things like Keras and stuff are, you know, are really fantastic to, to do, they're limited in that you can only basically build things that they have sort of already abstracted to build. It's much harder to basically drop down into pure TensorFlow. And that, that's one of the things that's going to change. And we'll talk about that later on. I, the other thing with the, the sort of uh, the pure TensorFlow API is that it's a lot more work than Keras and TFLearn. I, but it also, I think one of the biggest things about it is it allows you to actually understand more about what's going on in your network and then sort of get a, a much better sense of you know, how the deep learning actually work, works. And one of the things that I know for myself and when I speak to a lot of other people, when you use Keras or something like that, it's great and in a few lines you can write a network, but then most people don't understand actually what that network is doing. They see that like, you know, this is a certain type of layer, Okay, but what does that mean? And what does that actually mean mathematically? With TensorFlow, a lot of what you're going to be doing is basically, you know, the actual math mathematical app, you know, operations. Uh, okay, and then the other thing I think is probably one of the biggest advantages of, of working in sort of pure TensorFlow is you've got access to TensorBoard, which allows you to basically uh, do everything from look at your graph, uh, to you know, look at the training rates for different things throughout it. So the big concepts of TensorFlow, I think there are four main concepts that you need to understand. The first is the graph, the second are the operations that you run on the graph, the third are sessions that basically run your graph for you, and the fourth is TensorFlow. So I'm going to try and go through these four things tonight and I give you a sense of like, you know, what, what they are, how they work. So the, the, one of the biggest things is that the graph, uh, everything has to be built on a graph before you can execute. And you'll see when I go to the code in a minute what, what this actually sort of means. I, but unlike you know, normal sort of code, you don't just write a piece of code and then you can just do, put it into a print statement or print out the mathematical you know, uh, operation. I, the other thing is the graph can actually be built, we can, we can write our graphs in different languages, in quite a number of languages now. Just overnight they've also added uh, Java as an experimental language, they've added Go. Uh, there are quite a number of, of graphs that, you know, sorry, quite a number of languages that you can write your graph in. But generally what happens is all of these languages then get converted down and compiled to C++. 
And this is one of the things that allows TensorFlow to be so fast, is that it can compile it in such a way that then those uh, equations and operations can be distributed very easily. There's a new thing uh, called XLA, which uh, you know, we'll talk about later on, uh, that was announced overnight, which is going to basically take this to even a higher, you know, to sort of a better level of where TensorFlow will be actually be able to sort of edit and optimize your graph for you as it's compiling it. So the operations, operations are what's performed on the graph. Uh, this relates for everything from standard math operations to common deep learning formulas and tools. I, this gives you sort of that high level of gran you know, uh, granularity in your model to really get down and see exactly what's doing what and be able to change something and see does it do something. This is really important. It's one of the reasons why TensorFlow is so favored by researchers. It's because if you're trying to come up with something new, you can't just use pre-made layers that other people have already made for you. Uh, sessions. Sessions get executed on the graph. Nothing is run until you init, you know, to initialize and run a session. And finally, the TensorFlow gives you a visual representation uh, of our model, gives us stats about our training variables like loss, accuracy, etc. And TensorFlow soon is going to actually have debugging inside it. Okay, uh, I will come back to that. Let's jump into some code. So, how many of you know Python? Oh, wow, that's fantastic. <laughs> so many people, okay. All right. All right, so I'm guessing the people, you, everyone knows Jupyter Notebooks? I don't need to explain what Jupyter Notebooks are, right? Yes, is that? <laughs> okay. So, basically I've got a notebook here, and I'm gonna go through, uh, <coughs> A very simple network that I've built, I, and explain it. And first of all, I'm going to also explain some of the things about the graph and some of the things about the operations and stuff. So the first thing we need to do is we actually need to set up our graph. So one of the best ways to do this is to reset the default graph. I, this allows us to basically clear anything that was on the graph beforehand and, and get a, you know, sort of like a brand new default graph. We then basically uh, can set up a session if we want. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start off with a very simple sort of uh, neuron thing, just very simple math equations. You can see here we've got two inputs, three and a four. Uh, we've got the node C that's doing a simple addition. We've got D doing a multiplication, uh, and D also doing multiplication. So let's look at how we write that in TensorFlow. So, I'm going to start off with some con uh, constants. We're basically going to just define them. And this is how we def you know, define things in, in TensorFlow. We basically, uh, even though these are very similar to NumPy, uh, you know, uh, NumPy numbers and things like that, TensorFlow has its own set of everything. And you're best to use TensorFlow's own ones, otherwise when you actually run a model, it has to copy them from NumPy and actually then turn them into TensorFlow. So it actually slows down the process of running your model. So here I've got basically, let me just go through this. Okay, so here I've, I've done my assignments, right? I've basically put the input A, input B, I've got it an addition happening here, I've got a multiply, and I've got another multiply. Now, if I print out C, what do you think we should see? So if we were using just normal Python numbers or something like that, or ints or floats or anything, we would actually see the result of the equation. But we don't here. It basically just returns a tensor. Because we, what we've done is we've actually assigned these to our graph, I, but we haven't actually run the graph at all. So actually, if we come down here, we can actually see what's on our graph. And we can see that these are what we've already put on the graph. And if we want, we can actually start to look at, you know, at some of those. So let's look at the A multiplication, uh, multiplying B. Uh, so this is basically looking at the node definition. Uh, we can see that it's basically uh, a model op. We can see the two inputs that are coming into it. Uh, we can see that it's a flow. We won't, you know, we don't actually see the value though, because there's no no value assigned to it yet. 
Okay, if we want to actually see something, we need to run it in a session. So here I've just got a print statement wrapping a session run command. And now we can see the, the number that's assigned to that. And then now we can actually, uh, we can actually do two, two things here. We can run E, which is basically our last thing. And it's very important to understand that when you, when, let's say we were running this node, TensorFlow knows that to run this node, it needs to run all the, all the other nodes that connect to it. It takes care of all of that for us. So now we've run that node. At the same time, I've also set up a summary writer to basically send the graph to TensorBoard. So if I come over here, there's our graph. And if you see, if we click on these things, we can actually see what they are. We can see what each operation does. Okay, so moving along. Does everyone know what a tensor is? Okay, but the fact that people haven't put up their hands, I'm guessing not everyone. So I. The best way to think of a tensor, or the way I like to think of it, is either a, a multi-dimensional array or a multi-dimensional matrix, an n-dimensional matrix. So I put a, a couple of pictures of one so that you can start to sort of think about it. I, this is kind of like a normal array that we would think about in, in code. I, then we've got like you know a 2D tensor, a 3D tensor, a 4D tensor, a 5D tensor, a 6D tensor. I, very quickly representing these things in a way that humans can sort of think about them just goes out the window. And you'll see that often you will have uh, you know, uh, very, you know, very high dimension tensors going on and being passed around. So doing the, doing the little math stuff that we did before is not a big deal at all. But now let's, let's sort of start to work with, some, with a matrix. So we're going to basically make a matrix. Again, I've reset the default graph. I've basically started a session. Uh, okay, so in Jupyter Notebooks, exclamation mark means just a command line thing. So I'm basically just removing the, the previous TensorBoard files there. Uh, and what I've done here now, oops, I forgot to stop the TensorBoard. Okay, so when you're running TensorBoard, you need to obviously stop it. <laughs> Let's try this, okay. I, so now I'm setting up two, I, matrices and basically we're just doing uh, very simple ones and I'm going to multiply them together. So if I want to get the shape of one of them, uh, how many people know NumPy, NumPy very well? Okay, quite a few of you. So in, in NumPy we basically just say dot shape. In TensorFlow we have to say dot get shape. And we can see the dimensionality of it there. Okay, let's run it. There's a, so yeah, okay, I'm just sort of printing these out so you can actually see what's in, inside them. Uh, and then there's the matrix being calculated. And we'll, we'll go back to TensorBoard and have a look at it. And the reason I want to, I want to sort of show you this is that even though it doesn't look that amazing, is that I want you to understand that even though you see just sort of one little node there, one little thing going on there, that's actually a, mat a matrix with lots of numbers. And it could be like 10,000 by 10,000 numbers. So when you see things represented in, you know, in, on the TensorBoard, you need to sort of like uh, often hi highlight them, click on them, see what they're doing, get a sense of what's actually going on. Okay, let's jump in and build a network. So, uh, I'm going to build a very simple MNIST network. Uh, does everyone know what MNIST is? MNIST is basically just a bunch of digits. Uh, so the stock standard, boring thing that everyone uses. Um, 
We're going to build a very simple um, MDIS network. I'm going to just bring in the set up my train test split. So basically, what I, uh, MDIS is 65,000 images. So yeah, we've got uh, or 60,000. I've kept it. Okay. okay. So we've got 60,000 images. Uh, we're basically uh, taking 50,000 for our training and 10,000 for our testing. Yeah. So going back to sort of like the tensor thing, it, it, it's good to think about you know images and what is that what does that tensor look like for an image? So the MNIST images are 28 by 28 pixels. So I made a little sort of picture here to show you. So we've got 28 by 28, and then we're going depth for the number of pictures that we've got. Now, if this was if this was say an inception network or something else that was dealing with proper you know photos, each one of these would generally have three layers. We'd have an RGB. So if the, if this was actually in color, we would have 28 by 28 by three, and then depth for number of images. Now, actually, what we're doing with the MNIST uh, tonight is we're not going to do anything sort of CNN or convolutional, so we're actually just flattening the tensor to make it a, a, a vector, which is basically 784 numbers. And that's basically just done by taking the top row of pixels, taking the next row of pixels, and just sticking it on till we get to the end. We can still use, you know, we can still use num numpy or something like that to basically represent them. So here you can see I'm printing out some of the numbers. And we can see like what the, what the labels are. Uh, okay. Now what, what I want to do is building a, a batching system because we can't just put 50,000 you know, images into TensorFlow. It's not going to be you know, a, a good way of doing it. Especially if we had, yeah, actually probably 50,000 we might be able to, but let's say you know, we had like 500 million pixels going in, or 500 million images going in. Uh, so we need a batching system. So the batching system here is actually uh, from TensorFlow's MNIST. Uh, TensorFlow actually uses MNIST as one of their, their sort of uh, tutorial things, so it's actually part of their library, and they've actually made a batching system for it. So basically, all I have to do is call this, and it will give me a batch of X, a batch of Y. So the X is the, the tensors with 784 right, the vectors, and the Y is just the labels. All right, so the Y is basically just going to be a one hot encoded uh, 10 vector. So basically for the number, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, right up to 9. Can I make it bigger? Okay. All right, so here's a sort of rough diagram of what we're going to build. I, so we're going to have 784 inputs going into a hidden layer of 384, going into another hidden layer of 100, going to an output of 10. Any questions about that, or do people understand you know, what's actually going on there? I think it's, that's reasonably self-explanatory. So we're going to set up our, our hyperparameters. <coughs> I'm not trying to train the network for any sort of massive accuracy or anything like that. I'm just trying to keep it reasonably quick. So, uh, uh, good question. Very good question. So the, the real answer is voodoo. <laughs> you you get a sense. Uh, the you know the more networks you build, the more you, you can get a sense. So okay, so <laughs> I made a mistake. Is why it's three eight four, right? Because for some reason I kept thinking the number six, seven six eight in my brain. So I halved that, and I I I was basically going for half you know uh, half of whatever it started out at. Here's what you want. You don't want too many because you've got too many. You're just going to get your network overfitting all the time. You don't want too few, because then the network won't be able to generalize and learn. So you will learn that uh, you know over time you'll get a sort of sense of like, okay, and there are some formulas out there, but I wouldn't say that any of the formulas are sort of guaranteed to work all the time, every time. 
It also depends a lot on what you're doing. Here we're doing a very simple uh, multi-layer perceptron. If we were doing convolutions, it would be very different. Okay, yes, exactly, right? So the last one is basically where we're going to compare it against the labels. So we're basically, what we're doing is we're crunching all the numbers through here. I, and you can see I've sort of drawn where, okay, they, all, all these are coming into one node here. They go all out, right? Eventually you've got uh, 100 nodes going into 10. Sorry? Uh, yeah, you can, in, in some ways, I, um, I would say actually for something like MNIST, half the pixels are not relevant, right? Really, the, the network can learn on, on you know, there, there are certain pixels in something like MNIST uh, that tell it whether it's a number or not. For example, a good example would be the center pixel. Right? If you think of the, the, you know, three or four pixels around the center, if they're black, we know that there's a very high probability it's not going to be a zero. So there are certain pixels that are actually sort of more valuable than other pixels. But this is one of the cool things about deep learning, right? We don't sit there and try and work out features. We just chuck it in and we let the, the network itself work out what the features are going to be important to it. Now if we, if, if, you know, if we had like a convolutional, uh, if it was a convolutional network, we'd actually take the filters and start looking at them and seeing which areas of the features respond the most. Uh, you'll see lots of diagrams that do that sort of thing online. Um, going back to your thing, yeah, we're crunching through, so we've got the 10 outputs. So we're going to basically output 10 separate numbers. And whatever is going to be uh, the highest number there, we're going to say that's the probability of being the one that we want. So let's look at how we do that in code. So we've got, we set up our hyperparameters, right? We've got uh, learning rate, training epochs, batch size, uh, display step is just for, for showing. That's not a big, big deal. And then I've just got some things for saving the model. Uh, and then here we've actually got, you know, what our model is. So I talked about this before. We've got 784 for the first layer for our inputs. I, we've got 384, then 110. Okay, so here now we're, we're basically getting a new graph so that we can actually see the graph once we've been done. And the other thing I'm doing here is actually defining the inputs. So inputs we define as placeholders. So anything in TensorFlow that's a placeholder means that you can basically substitute values in and out of it very easily. So you'll use placeholders always for things like inputs. You'll also use them for things like learning rate if you were going to have a decaying learning rate that you wanted to change with each batch or with each epoch or something like that. You would then make your learning rate a placeholder. Uh, okay, so an epoch, very good question. <laughs> um, an epoch is one run through the entire training set. All right, so we're doing it in batches of 100, but we're gonna get through 50,000 images. So one epoch is one run through. So I'm doing four epochs here. Now I'm not going to get a very high accuracy score because four is not exactly, you know, often you'll see people train with like you know, a thousand epochs for certain things. It's 200,000, right? Four times 50,000. Right, good question, very good question. Because I remember when I first learned that too, I also wondered for a long time. I. Okay, so I've set up the inputs. Now we're at our network. So this is sort of like all the juicy part. All right, so we, this is gonna, I'm defining this as, uh, as a method. We're gonna basically pass in our training set, which is gonna be x, into here. Now, there are some bits, I'm gonna explain different bits at a different time, right? Okay, so let's look first at actually the hidden layer operations. So the hidden layer operations that we're gonna do are in addition, Right? I, and we're going to do a matrix multiplication before we do that addition. 
So we're actually going to use weights and, and biases. So does everyone understand what weights are? I know. So basically weights are, are things that are, are, is what the network is actually going to change to learn. So it can't change the input, right? If we change the input, we're changing the pixel. We can't change that. So the thing, well, we actually can if we want to. Uh, one of the things that we played around with a lot was um, <coughs> adversarial images. Martin and I have had a lot of things with adversarial images, where instead of training the network, you train the images. So you can make a, an image that looks perfectly right to a human as a Mercedes Benz or something, and they put it in Inception Network, and it says, oh, it's a nice big Persian cat. <laughs> and what's, what's going on there is you're training, you're making very small changes to the pixels. But we're not doing that here, right? We're basically making small changes to the weights right? and to the biases. So here, I, up here, I actually set up the weights and the biases for, for this first layer. So I just changed this before we started. I, so what, what I've got here is what we call uh, a truncated normal. So this is basically just a random number. I, with a, a very small standard deviation. And if it, if, if it picks the random number outside of that deviation, it basically drops it and picks one again. So we're doing that because we don't want, for example, all of our weights, we want to try and keep our weights as close together as possible to get an efficient and good generalizing network. If we had all our weights between, say, negative one and one, and then we've got two or three weights that are three or four hundred, that's going to really, that could cause a lot of problems inside the network. Now, it may just train out, but it, it isn't always guaranteed that it will. So in this way, we're basically dropping anything that's outside the standard deviation that we set. Uh, so I've got my weights there. Uh, I've got the bias. Uh, so then, yes, we've got here, okay, so we've got basically uh, our matrix multiplication, which is multiplying the x by the weights. So how many weights are there for each for each thing? Same size as whatever we're feeding in, right? So yeah. So 784 weights for each of these things. I okay, so we, we basically multiply those. We then add that to the, the bias. I and then we basically put it through what's called an activation function. So an activation function is basically making sure that what we're doing here is not just a linear function. I, we're basically, and the activation function that we're using is called ReLU, right, or Rectified Linear Unit. And I didn't have a picture, I should have drawn a picture. So if, ReLU is very simple to, to think about. It's just basically anything under zero doesn't go through, uh, it just passes through zero. Anything above zero, it passes through whatever the, the value was. So other activations that used to be very popular are things like you know, sigmoid, softmax, uh, tan, still, still for certain networks. Uh, but generally nowadays, most people are going to use a, a ReLU for, for most things. Just because it seems to be one of the best ways of training, uh, training our network. So, OK, so we've, we've gone through the weights and bias. We've gone through the two operations for our first hidden layer. Hidden layer. We've now got uh, TensorBoard. I will come back to what this is actually doing in a bit. I, and so when you see these, these scopes, I'm actually scoping it I, not in a traditional sense for sort of like, you know, scope as in a programming sense. This is for TensorBoard. So we're basically saying that all the things in, in this belong to hidden layer one. So that when it draws the pictures nice later on, it will draw it nice and neatly. neatly. Okay, so hidden layer two is basically the same as hidden layer one. We've got our weights, we've got our bias, we've got our uh, addition matrix multiplication, and we've got a ReLU activation going out. And then we've got our last output layer, uh, which again is very similar. We've got our weights, and we've got our logits layer. So the logits layer is going to output, uh, and this is what we're going to use to then check our loss for our error function to see, like, okay, what, you know, how close are we? What are we getting right? What are we getting wrong? And basically, the, this is what gets returned out of the function. So let 
this is from that. Uh, okay, so then we, we, def we basically assign that method. Okay, now we're into our loss and optimizing, optimization functions. So the loss that we're going to be using here is cross-entropy loss. Uh, I'm not going to explain it. I, it's, if you, you can just do many searches for it, there's lots of information about how, you know, how it works. Uh, but there's lots of different types of losses that we could use. Uh, for Depending on what type of uh, network you're building and what it is that the, you know, we're trying to predict, etc., we might use different losses. So basically, we're, anyway, we're, we're basically assigning the loss here, uh, and then we've got our optimization function. So uh, a lot of people, probably a lot of you have heard of uh, gradient des descent, stochastic gradient descent. How many of you have heard of this? Yes. Okay. It's a very uh, popular one. We're, another one we're using is, the one I'm actually using is Adam. Right, put uh, gradient descent there so you can use that as well. How many of you know Adam? So Adam, Adam is, yeah, definitely not as well known, but it's probably a lot more effective nowadays. Mm -hmm. I, again, these are pretty complicated equations. And so TensorFlow is handling this for us. Now, here's the key thing, though, is that our optimization function is using it, our learning rate that we set earlier on, and it's using that to minimize the loss from the loss function. And what you don't see here, and what can be very confusing about TensorFlow at the start, is what is it actually doing then to make that loss? What it's actually doing is tweaking all those weights and biases. So it can work out what are, what are the weights, what are the biases, and it can then alter those and, and start tweaking them. I, okay, then I basically just got uh, another thing for TensorBoard where we're going to measure the accuracy. So I've just set that up. I, but that's actually not part of our, uh, our model. <coughs> per se. I could actually take that out. We don't need that. Uh, I've also initialized the variables, or I've actually set up an initializer to initialize the variables. They will only get initialized when they actually get run on the graph. I, I've got a saver, so that we can basically save the model. And then I've got uh, our, a few things related to our, our TensorBoard. We're basically going to make a file writer, so that we can write things to the actual uh, this, and then we can use look at those on, on TensorBoard. What we're going to do is we're going to measure some scalars. We're going to measure one for accuracy, one for loss. And then we've got a summary op. So we basically what a summary op does is it merges all your summaries so that it can just run the equation once. Uh, I'll, I'll sort of explain that a little bit more in a bit. Uh, okay, so this is so now we, our network is built, right? Our graph is built. Now we're actually at the point where we're going to actually train the graph. So let's look at what's going on here. We basically open a session. All right. We run the session in it. So everything gets initialized. We then start our training cycle. So this is just very simply for each epoch that we set. We've already set the number of epochs. Uh, we're basically just going to go through. Uh, and we're going to run all the batches. So we've got our for loop here is basically just going through and running batches. So you can see each time it gets a batch of X and Y, it then, uh, the way it gets those, and what, it, what it actually does, sorry, what, one of the times it's got those, what it does is it puts those in what's called a feed dictionary. And the feed dict is basically what gets put, entered into TensorFlow for all its op you know, operations. All right, so what we're doing here is we're basically uh, working out the summary op. Remember I talked about that before? So that as, as we're going around each batch, it's not only just calculating, you know, training the network, it's also calculating our loss and our accuracy and storing that to TensorFlow. So we can see that later on. Uh, yeah, and then we're, we're basically going to print out and see how it goes. And at the end of that, we've got our, our save, so we're going to save our model. So for saving the model, all you have to do is this. And what I was trying to do sort of tonight was basically give you a sort of set of code that you can take home and then tweak it for a bunch of other models yourself. All right? And you can use things like the, you know, the saver and stuff like that. So okay, our first uh, epoch is done. Let's see, how are we going to go? We're running all of four epochs. 
So, okay, okay, so basically it's sort of saying um, open up the session and then with this session open, we're going to run all these things and then you can automatically close it by yourself later on. If we wanted to, we could actually do a session close, you know, a, a session close as well. Does that explain it? No, no. I was curious about the width. Did this? Yeah, like width is all the time. Okay, so it, this one is different than the ones I'm using up here. The ones I'm using up here is basically saying with the scope of, so let's say, say this one, with the scope of accuracy for TensorBoard, I want you to perform these equations and store them under that scope. Right? <laughs> You can define whatever you want. Yes. That's one of the cool things about TensorFlow, is you can actually then put your own functions into different things. So if you think that you've got a better you know, activation function than I, uh, you know. Okay, so yes, you, you do have to do a lot of work to do it, right? And it's not something that, that's e you know, easy to do, but you can actually do it, right? You can define all your own sort of Python functions to do certain things. I'm not going to go ahead through how to do that. That's a, a lot more advanced. It's going to be a lot, a lot more confusing. Um, but you can, right? Just go and do a search on the API for using you know, Python functions for, for different things you can do. It. I, and you and you can if you've got a good function, you can actually then contribute it to you know uh, to the actual project. So there is actually a tf.contrib where people have put in you know different ways to, to calculate certain things. Uh, you, you you can define this is the whole point about TensorFlow is because it's basically just one big mathematical graph. You can cut and change whatever you want. Now, doing it for the optimizer is not going to be easy because you're going to then have to think of like how it handles the back propagation. You're going to have to go through and you know check and make sure that your function handles all those things the way the way the TensorFlow expects them to be handled. But it's something that you can do. Okay, we finished our training. We got. Uh, let's see how do we go against the test set. So now what we're doing is we're basically just running the model again. I, but I'm loading the saved model that we just saved before, and I'm bringing it in, and we're going to use it to predict against the test set. So it hasn't seen the test set yet, right? It's just seen the training set. Okay, it got 97.5% accuracy, which is okay, but not that amazing for MNIST, right? I, that said, considering we only had four epochs and a pretty you know, a uh, small network, it's not bad, right? Um, okay, let's jump into to some more interesting stuff. The, the thing is now, as we've gone through there, we've been adding a lot of things to the TensorFlow. And this is where uh, TensorFlow can really shine. So let's look at our graph. Now we've got a bit more substantial graph than what we had before, right? right? So, there are a few things here that we... Um, the training is basically, we can just take that off and put it on the side for the moment. And this is here where you'll see what basically is uh, sort of the model that I put out there. It's just you know, clipped a bit. I, we've basically got our inputs. So let's look at what, what are in our inputs. In our inputs, we basically have got the X input, right, which are all our pixels, and we've got the labels. We look at our uh, hidden layer. We can see, okay, we basically uh, have got our, uh, our H1, sorry, we've basically got our weights and our biases, uh, and we've got them, the math that's been done there. We can even look at, you know, uh, at, at how we're calculating every, you know, the, the cross entropy. 
there's a bit more sort of there's a bit more to that than say that some of the other ones. Um, now this is a really simple model. So anything we've got in here, if we wanted to, you know, if we want to inspect it, we can basically just click on it, and we can see, you know, what's over here. And it will seem that when you've got a very simple model, that okay, well, it's not a big deal to be able to see it like this. But when you've got a much more complicated model, it is a very big deal because we can do things like general trace inputs. Now whatever I've got clicked, I see what goes into it, but not what comes out of it. So if I'm worried that, oh, okay, there should be something going in here, but why is it doesn't seem to be working, and very quickly I can isolate and see, oh, okay, it's not actually feeding what I thought it was feeding in there. Let's say we didn't have the hidden layer one connected to hidden layer two or something like that. We'd be able to see that very quickly here. Okay, we can also come over here and look at our training doesn't look that good. <laughs> I'll make it right. One second. So when you're using TensorFlow, it's, it's actually saving to a, uh, it's, you're basically logging out to a directory and saving to that directory. And I, I've actually set up, uh, you know, it's actually saving to a subdirectory. Okay. So now we can basically see our accuracy going up as it trained and we can see our loss going down. Uh, and we can get a very, a, a sense now, you know, okay, and this, this, is, this is kind of standard, right, what we've got here in this network. But often you will see, uh, there'll be like a big spike, or you know, where something, you know, maybe the, the learning stopped at a certain point. Maybe your learning rate was too high, and the learning plateaued. You would be able to see that very clearly here. The other thing that we can do too is, because we set up those histograms, we can actually go and see what's happening with our weights and our biases <coughs> over time. So we can look and see sort of in a 3D way, or we can go So we can see you know, what's actually happened here with, as we've been training our model. And we can get a sense here, okay, this is what, what our, uh, our biases are. So the biases are actually pretty good. We can see that there's nothing radically too low, there's nothing radically too high. They're all in a very nice band. And that also explains why the model trained, pretty, you know, trained well and trained pretty quickly. Our weights also are you know, reasonably in good places. There's nothing out of the ordinary in this model. But if there was, you would be able to see that very quickly. So TensorFlow, sorry, TensorBoard is one of the key things that you need to sort of, um, uh, if you're going to be using ten TensorFlow, you want to sort of learn to set up the TensorBoard so you can constantly come back and benchmark your stuff and go back and look at it through different things. Uh, Uh, yeah, we could put something like that in, in if we wanted to, yes. Uh, we could have that if it reached a certain level, then it would just stop. So we basically code that into our training section. Right? Another thing that we will use a lot is like a decaying learning rate. So that's one of the things too. Um, let's see if we can predict an image. <laughs> we got the one image that we picked, we got wrong. <laughs> so it's predicted a six. And it's actually supposed to be a five. Let's pick something else. Okay. 
Okay, zero. You can see that it's predicting most of the images right. Okay, so let, let me just go through TensorBoard. And some of that, that code that I didn't explain before is that to make TensorBoard work, you need to basically set up your graph right. I, otherwise, it will just look like a whole mess all over the place. Right. So the key things that you need to be able to reset your, your graph, your default graph, and you notice is each example I've gone through, I've reset the graph to basically get rid of the, the old whatever was there and, and start again. Um, you need to have a file writer. Right, to, what the file writer does basically is logs everything to the disk right, so that we can look it up later on. Uh, if you want to display something that's like a, a scalar or something like that, uh, you need a summary scalar. Summary histogram, uh, you merge them, and then uh, then when you're in training, you actually write the, those. You write to, to your file writer. And that basically then saves it. And then I uh, yeah, like I put here, it's basically your this is this is a command line uh, thing. We're basically running TensorBoard on this directory. And we're then using, you know, in Jupyter, uh, exclamation marks for command lines. Um, if I wanted to, let's say I've, let's say we want to just quickly do something else. We do a two epoch run. But we're going to do a really, really low training rate. So what would you expect to happen? Is it going to learn well or not? No. We'd expect that a pumpkin is not going to learn well. Training escalation. Okay, let's just see what we've got for that one. Uh, not very good accuracy. Right. Basically, double random. I let me just run through a different one with a much higher learning rate. Again, we're just going to do two epochs. And what I'm going to do this time is, mm. rather than just show uh, if it's going to work, it's been working sometimes and not working sometimes, uh, if, rather than just show the stats for one model, we're going to look at multiple models so that we can compare them. All right, we've got 74% on that second one. Okay, so we're running the TensorBoard again. See now, I, this is this is model eight. This is model nine. They're very very different. And we can see that I'm pretty sure the model eight was the one that did no learning at all. But here you you'll be able to start you know spotting things. Anyway, often you'll be able to, you should be able to see, I think it actually might be a part of 1.0 at the moment, or, I, or it could actually be, it's most, more likely my code, because I've got to change these as we've gone through different, different things. What I was doing, what I was changing, basically, is instead of us outputting to uh, just the, the, the folder simple, uh, log simple graph, 
we were making another folder, slash eight, slash nine, for the different models. And then when we basically just open this top folder, instead of the lower folder, we can see all the models that are in there. Okay, I, I think I've gone on for enough time. I've got another model, but uh, you can maybe go through this one yourself. Uh, it's basically a model for sentiment analysis. It's using almost the exact same model, but doing sentiment analysis. Um, anyway, I will put that up on, on GitHub, uh, and you can go through it. So we're going to show the time. I will take questions at the end. Is everyone cool with that? Uh, Martin, can you come up?